was not a big boat, just an open whale boat, eight metres long, propelled by a small sail and the rowing power of an eight-man crew. But this small boat made a very great journey and solved one of the major riddles of the Australian continent. The journey that charted the course of Australia's major river, the Murray, has to be ranked amongst the greatest feats of Australian exploration. Not simply because it was an epic of endurance, but because it unlocked the secret of the Australian rivers and exploded false notions which had seemed to limit the prospects of Australia. Forty years after the foundation of Sydney, less than 10% of the Australian continent had been explored and mapped by the European settlers. Evans and Oxley had tried to follow the western courses of New South Wales rivers, but had been beaten back by swamps. Hume and Hovell had crossed other western flowing rivers on their overland journey to Port Phillip. And Cunningham had crossed still more western flowing rivers on his journey to the Darling Downs in 1827. Because these rivers appeared to flow towards the centre of the continent, there was a widely held theory that they flowed to an inland sea. The chief author of this inland sea theory, Surveyor General Oxley, had tried to follow the Lachlan and Macquarie in flood years and was stopped by marshes, which he thought were the edges of the inland sea. Ten years later, with New South Wales in the grip of a severe drought, the governor, Sir Ralph Darling, thought it would be a good chance to tackle the Western Rivers again. But Oxley was too ill to lead another expedition. Darling chose instead a young English army captain who was anxious to achieve fame as an explorer. His name was Charles Sturt. In November 1828, Sturt's expedition left Sydney and headed northwest. They were certainly prepared for the possibility of an inland sea. As well as a boat, they carried a boat compass, a nautical almanac, 18 rockets as signal flares, and provisions for five months. Governor Darling realised that Sturt, while anxious to explore, had no qualifications as a surveyor or a bushman, and therefore he appointed Hamilton Hume as second in command of the expedition. This was a wise choice, and a lucky one for Sturt. No one could show him the ropes better than Hume, the redoubtable Australian bushman who had overlanded to Port Phillip and knew the ways and the languages of Aboriginal tribes. Well, Mr Hume, well, I think we should keep on this westerly bearing to those hills over there and then turn north. Splendid. The expedition moved past the dreaded Macquarie marshes that had blocked Oxley ten years before. Near the present site of Burke, Sturt climbed the summit of Oxley's tableland and observed the vastness of the plains below him. I have gained a knowledge of more than 100 miles of the western interior and have ascertained that no sea, indeed little water, exists on the surface. It was February 1829. The drought continued, the heat was intense and the creeks were dry. The party was becoming desperate for water, when all at once it seemed as if their prayers were answered. We suddenly found ourselves on the banks of a noble river. The men eagerly descended to quench their thirst. Shall I ever forget the looks of terror and disappointment with which they called out to inform me that the water was so salt as to be unfit to drink. This is the river which Sturt named the Darling and which he first reached upstream of Burke. 
Sturt thought the salty water indicated the nearness of an inland salt sea. But in fact, the salt came from natural brine springs and it showed up strongly because the river then was unusually low. The party now faced the weird prospect of dying of thirst on a riverbank until Hume saved them by finding a fresh water hole downstream. The expedition travelled 100 kilometres down the Darling, far enough to show that it continued in a southwesterly direction. And in further explorations, as they returned from the Darling, they established that the waters of the Bogan, the Macquarie and the Castlereagh all ended up in this river. Sturt's discovery of the Darling River undermined the theory of an inland sea. But for many years, Sturt remained fascinated by such a vision. On future expeditions, Sturt still believed that he would find an inland sea. However, Governor Darling did not share Sturt's vision of an inland sea, because he had heard of the discovery of a large freshwater lagoon on the southern coast of Australia. Studying the known courses of western rivers, Darling guessed at the solution to the puzzle. It is not improbable that the Darling River flows into the lagoon or some part of the Gulf. The result of this expedition may be important to the colony, and as the expense of the equipment is trifling, I have not hesitated to avail myself of Captain Sturt's services. Before the end of 1829, Darling sent Sturt on a second expedition to trace the course of the Murrumbidgee River. The Sturt expedition travelled southwest from Sydney until they had their first sight of the Murrumbidgee at Jugiong. Sturt was highly impressed by the country of the higher Murrumbidgee. But as he moved further west, he began to talk of barren and cheerless plains, as melancholy a tract as ever was travelled. By the time Sturt made camp near Maud, the wagons were sinking up to their axles in the soft ground. So he decided on what he called a bold and desperate measure to leave the horses and the wagons and to take a small party on down the river by boat. The next week was one of furious activity. The whale boat, which they'd carried in pieces, was now put together. Sturt carried a whale boat on all his expeditions, but this was the one where it proved its worth. As well, Sturt got his carpenter, Clayton, to fell a tree and build a skiff, half the size of the whale boat, to carry extra supplies. Mr. McClay, please ensure we have sufficient tea and tobacco on board, will you? On this second expedition, Sturt had as his second in command George Maclay, son of the colonial secretary. Hamilton Hume was too busy with his harvest to join the party. Joseph Clayton. While the boats were loaded, Sturt wrote his dispatches to Governor Darling and selected the six men to accompany him and Maclay downriver the following day. Well done, Joseph. Tie her up to the whaler, men. We'll load her in the morning. In the early hours of the 7th of January, 1830, Sturt's party made their final preparations. <laughs> the camp was a scene of bustle and confusion long before daylight. The men whom I had selected to accompany me were in high spirits and so eager to commence their labours that they had been unable to sleep but busied themselves from the earliest dawn in packing up their various articles of clothing. Oh 
Thank you for your help, Mr. Harris. This was an anxious moment for Sturt. Half the party would travel with him by boat on a voyage into the unknown. I'll be with you. All right, men, ready for a push off? All together? Carl Holland, back to me. The land party was to go back upriver and wait at Wantabadgery Plains for Sturt's return, if he returned. Good luck, Mel Holland. Goodbye. Notwithstanding that we only used two oars, our progress down the river was rapid. Hopkinson had arranged the load so well that all the party could sit at their ease. Fraser was posted in the bow of the boat, with gun in hand, to fire at any new bird or beast that we might surprise in our silent progress. Sturt's whaleboat, towing the skiff behind it, made rapid progress down the Murrumbidgee. 24 kilometres from his last land depot, Sturt passed a river coming in from the right, which he guessed, correctly, was the Lachlan. Sturt noted that the Murrumbidgee suddenly took a southerly course. As the expedition manoeuvred its way around the river's meanderings, Sturt found that the speed of the current was increasing. We were carried at a fearful rate down its gloomy and contracted banks. At 3 p.m., Hopkinson called out that we were approaching a junction, and in less than a minute afterwards, we were hurried into a broad and noble river. Such was the force with which we had been shot out of the Murrumbidgee that we were carried nearly to the bank opposite. We had got on the high road, as it were, either to the south coast or to some important outlet. As they travelled down this new river, the expedition met with numerous Aboriginal tribes. Sturt, according to his usual policy of cautious kindness, offered them the peace branch and gifts of tomahawks. One morning as Sturt broke camp near the present town of Mildura, 150 Aborigines gathered to see him off. Four of these tribesmen, including one giant warrior, followed along the banks as Sturt sailed down the river. Sturt soon had cause to be grateful that he'd made friends with these tribesmen. On a sand spit stretching nearly across the river, Sturt ran into a war party of some 600 Aborigines, painted with ochre and pipe clay, and with spears ready to throw. Cease rowing. Fraser, Harris, to arms. For the first time, it seemed Sturt would have to break his own rule and fire on natives. At the very moment when my hand was on the trigger and my eye along the barrel, my purpose was checked by McClay, who called to me that another party of blacks had made their appearance upon the left bank of the river. 
Turning round, I observed four men at the top of their speed. The foremost of them, as soon as he got ahead of the boat, threw himself into the water. He struggled across the channel to the sandbank and stood in front of the savages. Seizing one by the throat, he pushed him backwards and forced all who were in the water up on the bank. At one moment, pointing to the boat, at another, shaking his clenched hand in the faces of the most forward, he stamped with passion on the sand. This man was Sturt's giant friend from further up the river, and his arguments must have been as impressive as his size, because he subdued the war party. After this heart-stopping interlude, Sturt was able to see for the first time that the sand spit marked the mouth of a large new river coming in from the north. After rowing up it some distance, Sturt was convinced that it was the river he'd already discovered further north, the Darling. A very British moment followed as he celebrated his discovery. I directed the Union Jack to be hoisted. Three cheers for the, the men stood up in the boat and gave three distinct cheers. It is an English feeling, an ebullition. The eye of every native is fixed upon that noble flag at all times, beautiful object, and to them, a novel one, as it waves over us in the heart of this desert. Sturt was very much the 19th century Englishman, convinced that the savages of this desert could only benefit from British civilization, Protestant evangelism, the Union Jack and the Empire, all the values he stood for. What understanding he had of Aboriginal values came from an Australian-born explorer, Hamilton Hume. In fact, he owed Hume quite a lot. So it was a sad moment in the life of a generally decent man when Sturt returned from the Darling and named this main river the Murray. He must have suspected it was the Hume River, discovered by Hume and Hobble six years earlier. But he named it for Sir George Murray, the Secretary of State for the Colonies. So Australia's greatest river is not named for one of Australia's greatest explorers, but for a dim British politician who showed not the slightest interest in Australia. It was a piece of ambitious flattery by Sturt. Hamilton Hume could not award him governorships and knighthoods, but Sir George Murray might. The size of the Murray below the Darling convinced Sturt that this river would not peter out in a salt marsh. He wanted to travel faster, so he decided to burn the skiff he'd been towing. Sturt calculated they were now south of the head of St Vincent's Gulf and could not be far from the sea. But the Murray continued to loop about in the most baffling way, wriggling through the plains like a giant snake. Natives, in half a day's walk, could reach a point down river that took two days by boat. Sturt was becoming exasperated by the winding of the river when it came to a big bend near the present town of Morgan and then plunged in the direction of due south. At last Sturt believed he was on the road to the ocean and a most spectacular road it was. The river held on a due south course and at the same time changed its character. The cliffs under which we passed towered above us like maritime cliffs. They became brighter and brighter in colour, looking like dead gold in the sun's rays, and formed an unbroken wall of a mile or two in length. The natives on their summit showed as small as crows, and the cockatoos, the eagles and other birds were as specks above us. The birds that most interested Sturt were the seagulls, along with the choppy waves that rolled up the river and the evidence of tidal rise and fall in the water. The banks had now flattened out. The river itself was broad and deep. And the men, pulling desperately against a strong southwest wind, suddenly saw an unbroken horizon of water ahead. The view was one for which I was not altogether prepared. We had arrived at the termination of the Murray. 
Immediately below me was a beautiful lake, which appeared to be a fitting reservoir for the noble stream that had led us to it. Sturt guessed correctly that if he kept going southwest across this lake, which he named Lake Alexandrina, he might pick up the river channel again. A northeast wind blew Sturt's boat across the lake and into a channel of the river near the present town of Gulwa. But now his luck changed. He couldn't get his boat any further because of sandbars in the channel. 36 days after they'd taken to the boat, Sturt's party made camp on the narrow neck of land that separated the river from the Southern Ocean. Sturt set out to walk the last leg to the sea mouth of the Murray. But Sturt was also hoping to sight a ship, as Governor Darling had promised to send HMS Dart to meet him. There was no waiting ship, and as Sturt looked out over Encounter Bay, he felt that no ship could enter the bay to pick him up. His doubts were confirmed when he saw the sea mouth of the Murray. The mouth of the channel is defended by a double line of breakers, amidst which it would be dangerous to venture except in calm and summer weather. Thus were our fears of the intractability of the channel between the lake and the ocean confirmed. It was not the ideal port, but quite large ships did eventually enter this river. Sturt had in fact found what Darling had hoped he'd find, a great navigable waterway to open up the Australian inland as the Mississippi had opened America. That was all years ahead, and Sturt's judgment here was coloured by desperation. He was no longer on fresh water. His rations were running low, and they'd run lower every day that he spent waiting here. The natives here were hostile. They'd had a bad time from the white sealers. Sturt made a life or death decision to start immediately and row all the way from the Murray mouth back up to the Murrumbidgee. It was a terrible decision to have to make. They now faced the prospect of retracing their journey of discovery, but this time against the current, over 1,500 kilometres of river. The men were so exhausted that Sturt and Maclay now had to take their turn with the rest in pulling the oars. Journey upstream was a nightmare, pulling against the current, hauling the boat over logs and through rapids by using ropes. They were losing strength on their basic diet of tea and damper, and they were losing sleep because they now had to guard the camp constantly at night against Aborigines. Sturt and his crew had been living in their boat 77 days when they passed their old depot on the Murrumbidgee. They had rowed and sailed 3,000 kilometres. Sturt knew that relief for his men was weeks away. They had to row on, and the worst was yet to come. Murrumbidgee rose six feet upon us in one night. For the last 17 days, we've pulled against it with determined perseverance. But human effort, with privations such as ours, tend to weaken themselves. The men have lost that 
proper and muscular jerk with which they once made the waters foam and oars bend. The whole body swing with an awkward, laboured motion. Their arms appear to be nerveless. Their faces have become haggard. Their persons are emaciated. Spirits wholly sunk. It grieves me to the heart to see them in such a state, at the end of so perilous a service. This was the last gasp of the whaleboat crew. Sturt reached a camp downstream of the present town of Narendra. The men, he said, were completely sunk. They couldn't row another stroke. Sturt sent two men to walk 100 kilometres further upstream to Wantabadgeri to get help from the relief party. The rest of the men slumped around the campfire here for six days. Sturt literally burnt his boat here. They ate their last ounce of flour and the party were about to stagger forward on foot when the two men that he'd sent ahead returned. They looked dreadful, but they had the horses, the bullock drays and the stores. So it was all over. The expedition was saved. The news of Sturt's return reached Sydney in May 1830. And the Sydney Gazette said, Captain Sturt has inscribed his name in indelible characters upon the records of our history and will occupy a respectable rank among those heroic men to whom the world is indebted for geographical knowledge. That was a fair verdict, but Sturt never achieved the high rank that he wanted, and the rest of his life was a disappointment. He applied for the governorships of South Australia, Tasmania, Victoria, and Queensland, but he didn't get any of them, and his knighthood was only approved after his death. Sturt had rendered valuable service to Australia, perhaps the most valuable of any explorer. He discovered the Darling, charted the Murray to the sea, and mapped out the main framework of an inland river system that drained millions of acres of an area of the continent twice as big as France. His reports had an important influence on the foundation of South Australia and Adelaide, where his statue now stands in Victoria Square. In solving the riddle of the rivers, it seemed that Sturt had exploded forever the myth that Australia was a giant basin with its waters draining to an inland sea. But curiously enough, Sturt remained gripped by the notion of an inland sea somewhere in the centre of Australia. And he was to exhaust himself searching for it on one last expedition. It was his great rival, Major Mitchell, who capitalised on the really great discovery Sturt had begun with his conquest of the rivers.